I'm John Fancy. I'm a uh, BizHawk MVP um, for uh, uh, 10 years now, um, which uh, surprises me as well as everybody else who knows me, I think. Um, I, I wrote the, uh, the first and only, I think, book on um, BizHawk Services V1, um, as you can see there. Um, it's upside down for a reason. Um, <laughs> And we'll, we'll talk about, a little bit about that and uh, some of the challenges uh, that we've had and, and some of the fun that we've had in, in what we're going to talk about today. And uh, this is uh, Dan Probert. So, yep. Hi, seven. I'm uh, Dan Probert. I've been a uh, BizTalk consultant now for over 15 years, working on a wide range of uh, uh, BizTalk projects. And uh, I run a blog called BizBit. Um, yeah, that's about it for me. Great. Right. So, what are we going to talk about? Uh, what are we going to talk about? So I did this talk, uh, or a similar one, last year. And uh, back then, I was talking about um, thinking about how you might migrate BizTalk service solutions that you had running on premise, maybe connecting to third parties, business partners, et cetera, um, and how you might think about migrating those and moving those to BizTalk services. So uh, I thought it'd be fun to update that talk, given what everybody now knows on a lot of the great content yesterday about uh, the kind of change in the platform and, and the evolution of uh, BizTalk services and the move to logic apps and API apps, et cetera. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about um, uh, strategies, as well as tooling, as well as some fun things we've been working on around how you can think about migrating existing BizTalk assets from on-prem to uh, the cloud. And of course, you know, there's always that option we talked about yesterday. We could even run these things in the future on-premise as well. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of the practicalities of that as well. You know, some things are easy, some things are hard. So we're going to get into some of the details. Um, so yeah, so let's go. So probably the first thing to consider is, you know, why would you bother moving in the first place? And I think some of these things are, are, are kind of, you know, people get it, it's obvious, it makes sense. And some things are less so. so uh, cloud economics is, is you know, driving you know, a lot of the industry now, um, you know, from, from a cost perspective, from an agility perspective, you know, the ability to scale up and down, the, the consumption-based pattern where you just don't have to commit you know, large amounts of capital resources in order to stand up large environments anymore. You can just put your toe in the water, stand an environment up, uh, create some integration solutions, and if they're successful, if you need to grow on that, um, you can just scale it up, add more resources, and, and just pay for what you use. And that's a very powerful model, because especially when you consider you know, standard BizTalk environments where you may need you know, disaster recovery and backups and all this kind of stuff, you know, warm standbys, again, you don't have to have all of that stuff just sitting around on premise. You can, you can have a more, uh, a more agile, more flexible model when you run these things in Azure. So uh, that, you know, that's one reason. Another one is a, you know, an industry trend to you know, iPads, which is integration platform as a service. This, this growing trend, you know, and, uh, and Microsoft's not alone here, um, in offering integration platforms in the cloud. Um, so uh, what does that mean? Well, you know, it means, uh, for one thing, that you move out of the infrastructure, management, maintenance, uh, game, patching, all that kind of stuff, uh, security issues, you know, you can, you can focus more on the problem you're trying to solve and less around the infrastructure that you need to, you know, have that problem uh, running on once you've solved it. Um, and, you know, one of the cool features of API apps is that you can actually have these things auto-update um, as things are, uh, as things are changed, as uh, new features are added, they can actually just automatically update. So you kind of get the latest versions of everything, again, to take the administration burden off of you as, a, as an integrator. Um, I said integration is, is changing. You know, uh, probably one of the biggest changes is the, the, the kind of targets, the types of um, systems and customers that you connect to are fundamentally changing. Uh, the explosion of software as a service, um, cloud services. Uh, you saw you know, yesterday the move to standards like Swagger, which just make it super easy to be able to uh, find, purchase, use, consume, link up, and integrate with cloud services to on-premise assets, especially with the hybrid um, capabilities of, uh, of Logic Apps. Um, and this idea of a citizen integrated, the idea that you know, it's not uh, necessarily a sort of fully code-first experience where I just jump into Visual Studio by default and start building these things, I can actually do a lot of it in the browser. I don't have to be the classic IT uh, developer anymore in, in the uh, corporate IT department. I can actually um, be you know, outside of that and create these solutions based on pre-built components that maybe my IT department has built, uh, or maybe I've just uh, purchased or procured these from the marketplace or from the internet. So you know things are changing, and uh, you know fundamentally, I think you know one of the one of the things that you know really makes sense to me, uh, at any rate, is that 
clearly, you know, a new platform really makes these things, you know, really lights this stuff, stuff up more easily. Um, and then it becomes, well, you know, I, I really want a way then of thinking about, well, when does it make sense to be able to move these assets from on-premise and run them in the cloud as well? Not just the, you know, the endpoints in the cloud, but actually run my integration, my compute in the cloud as well to do that integration. Uh, you know, so, um, so why wouldn't you do it? Well, I think one of the reasons today, um, you know, certainly with the preview, um, you might, might do it because it might not make sense. So you may, um, you may have two you know, classic enterprise application integration scenario where you've got uh, two systems on premise, you know, why would you go out to the cloud and back again? So some things won't make sense, but again, over time, I think you'll see some of those things will, uh, will be runnable on premise as well with Azure Pack, as, uh, as the guys talked about yesterday. So you know, all of this is kind of moving the, moving the industry forward and, uh, and changing the technology used to do it. So, so what changed? Well, um, so what changed was the replatforming of business services. So uh, I, I guess where we are now, there's kind of these three different options. You've got Bisoc Server on premise. You've got Bisoc Services V1, uh, you know, GA service running in Azure, and then you've got this new preview service, Logic Apps, uh, API Apps, etc. Um, so today you could pick any one of those three things. I guess you probably would be unlikely to use a preview service in production. Um, uh, I just imagine those guys would probably recommend that you don't. But you know, certainly when you when you look at uh, a lot of long projects, you have to start thinking ahead. You know, when does it make sense to use these different technologies? Um, so what's happened to BizTalk is that at least BizTalk Services, it's been broken out into these individual you know API apps. You know, the, I think microservices was the term used previously. You know, this idea that I can componentize what was a boxed product on-prem and componentize that, break that up. And of course, that gives huge amounts of advantages in terms of pluggability and scalability and flexibility in terms of how I then coordinate, compose these things together to create an enterprise uh, you know, in, in integration solution. So things like mapping and rules and validation, all the rest of it all light up as, as API apps. Um, and uh, you know, another fundamental change from business services is no longer kind of workflow, Windows workflow based. You know? so, uh, uh, so I think the product group said yesterday, you know, some of the asks around the business services of V1 was that you know, the templates were limited in what you could do, the styles of integration were limited. A lot of that just melts away with the new capabilities and flexibility that you've got. So you know, it's kind of obvious somebody's, somebody's got to write a new book, right? Because things have changed significantly. So, so uh, again, I, I showed this last year because it's, uh, I think it's circa BizTalk 2004 or TechEd 2004, something like that. So when you look at you know, the differences, between, you know, I'm assuming most people here, you know, are familiar with BizTalk Server, you know, much more so than, than Azure and, and some of these cloud services. So, I mean, is that true? Show of hands, are you BizTalk guys or Azure guys? Yeah, yeah, so at least half the audience. That makes sense, right? It's a BizTalk conference. You're probably in the wrong place if you, if you don't know anything about BizTalk. So, um, but when you look at what's there uh, with BizTalk Server, you've got maps and pipelines and orchestrations and rules and schemas and all this other stuff, right? And some of it looks like it clearly maps onto the new world, and some of it kind of doesn't. So some of these problems, you can sort of readily see how you would start to look at moving these things or creating new solutions in the same way as you did on-prem or with BizTalk Server. And some things need a sort of different approach, a different way of looking at that. You know, BizTalk had a very strong notion of transactionality, so everything was kind of DTC-based. You know, this, uh, this exactly once delivery semantic where you bound a transaction between the source and the target uh, through the message box, you know, through BizTalk. So, uh, you, you had a, this, this uh, consistency model really baked deep into the product, and that just doesn't make a lot of sense in the cloud. So, you know, things change. Uh, cloud tends to work on a more of an eventual consistency model. So that's a challenge. So uh, I'm going to go through these one by one. I'm going to start with the easy stuff, because uh, it's the easy stuff, and then we'll start getting to some of the more complicated stuff and how we can, how we can think about that. Um, so, you know, mapping. Uh, it, it, it's, it's clear that there's a, in business services V1, as there is in um, Logic Apps, there's a mapping transformation solution, and now it's a, a, a transformation API app. And it's based on um, the TRFM files, the transform files that you created in Maps V1, which means you can just take those if you've already created them and running that service today, and take them and upload them and run them as an API app. Um, but there's other approaches if you have existing BizTalk server assets as well, and you want to be able to reuse those um, without starting from scratch. You know, a lot of people invest a lot of time in creating complex maps and rebuilding those from BDM files in BizTalk server to TRFM files in, uh, in uh, Logic Apps. It could be a lot of work. You know, some people spend a good couple of weeks or more you know, building these things when you have thousands of links and complex schemas, etc. So. Uh, it's good if there's a way of being able to migrate that as well. And um, you know, there's, there's kind of three basic approaches that 
you know, a lot of BizTalk server maps are just XSLT, and the functoids kind of boil down to XSLT. Um, so you can just use that as is. You know, the, the, the Terraform mapper kind of supports XSLT. Um, you use the same Visual Studio designer um, in, the, in, the, in the new stuff as you did in the old stuff. So you can just spin up Visual Studio, use that great um, graphical mapper to create your maps, and take XSLT out of BizTalk server and put it into the new product, upload it, and have it running as a logic app. Um, you could also convert it. There's a Microsoft provided tool to a uh, command line tool. It's uh, part of the BizTalk Services SDK. And you can run that and, uh, and convert your maps from one format to the other. It does a pretty good job um, of being able to do that. And you know, there may be some tweaks that you need to do at the end, but it gets, gets you started. The other thing you could do is you, know, you could host maps as an API app, right? You, um, it's something that, uh, that we've been looking at doing. Um, uh, we're not going to show it now. Um, but uh, we're going to show some other stuff instead. But uh, being able to take a BizTalk map, which is um, you know, really, when it boils down to the runtime and, you, and, and how it works, it's just using the .NET framework. It's using the XLT, it's using the XML, it's using the extensions, all supported by the .NET framework. So you could take these maps and run them as is as a logic app. You could, you could wrap that up, API app, in your logic app, you know, as part of a pipeline of components, and run maps as is. So you know, that's, that's a good story. So it's, uh, let's move on. Um, I said I was going to cover the easy stuff first. <laughs> so then you've got rules. Well, uh, this is something I talked about last year, and there was no kind of rule solution in business services. The great news now is there's now a rules or uh, policy um, API app. So uh, similar concepts, similar type of engine. So I can create policies, I can create uh, vocabularies, and I can uh, I can have rule sets in a similar way to the way I did it in BizTalk Server. You know, right now, you know, it's too early to say whether there'll be you know, some structural similarity in being able to convert those, but it's something that we are, we are actively looking at and working with the product group on to be able to take you know, each one of these individual artifacts from BizTalk Server and be able to convert them and run them uh, in, uh, in the new service in, uh, as a logic app. Uh, trading partner management, again, you know, this is uh, another API app in that uh, componentized, you know, uh, decomposition model. Um, so you may have, you know, many thousands of trading partners already set up. You know, they go into a SQL database on-prem, and you want to be able to move those rather than rekey them all, because um, that's no fun, um, in, uh, in the new service. So uh, BizHook Services provided a way, a tool to be able to take um, uh, point at your BizTalk environment, take those trading partners and do the conversion to the new schema to upload them into a SQL database in Azure. Um, so, you know, I think uh, one of the things you can kind of uh, uh, see working there again is that, well, you know, the formats will be kind of similar, so you, you should expect a kind of similar experience. And again, it's something that, you know, we're working on to how you can take, you know, a situation where you have thousands of trading partners and be able to migrate them across. So, okay. So let's get to some more sort of slightly interesting stuff. So when we started looking at this um, and, and how we were going to tackle this problem, um, you know, BizTalk pipelines are kind of fundamental to the messaging infrastructure in, in, in BizTalk Server. So um, you, you receive something over an adapter and you kind of do some work on it in the pipeline and you do, you know, it goes in the message box, you do something else, maybe you call orchestration, and then you come back and you do the same thing in reverse and send it out through a send adapter. And that kind of pipeline of processing it's kind of similar to the experience that you see today in the uh, portal in, um, in Azure for logic apps. You know, I have these cards that I lay down, and there's this kind of inferred or partially inferred execution of how these things work together. I think Stephen talked yesterday about, well, when you start having conditions of these things, you can change the execution flow through this. But from a pure mapping to BizTalk server, you know, these um, assembling and disassembling pipelines kind of map quite nicely, again, with the API apps that are provided you can see how you can receive you know, a flat file and turn it into an XML document and do some validation on it. Um, you could spin over it in a list and split it out and process each one of those individual messages individually and send it off downstream to something else. Um, so, uh, and we're going to show that. So, um, so looking you know, uh, a bit deeper, so the execution model for logic apps is, is, is very similar, I think. Uh, conceptually to what you can do in BizTalk Server. You know, there are some differences. You, know, you don't have transactions, for example, but you know, if you don't need that, then you know, it, it, it kind of maps quite nicely. So um, custom pipeline components, you could imagine, could be lit up as um, API apps. You, know, you could convert those and plug them into that uh, logic app um, flow that, uh, that runs these things one after the other kind of sequentially, chaining them together. But some things are different. You know, things like message types, some, some of the way the API apps work are slightly different because 
Uh, BizLock server kind of works out the message type from the root node namespace, whereas you kind of specify that stuff explicitly with an API app. But it's all kind of there. It all kind of works. Right. So I'm going to just pause there um, and say, you know, wouldn't it be great if somebody was working on, you know, I, I, I actually want to move some of this BizLock server stuff. And maybe I'm running old versions of BizLock server. Maybe I need to upgrade to a new version of BizLock server. Maybe I just want to get some, some of the cloud economics working for me. And I want to be able to host some of this stuff as Logic App, but I don't want to kind of rewrite this thing from scratch, you know, everybody left years ago and, you know, I don't have any documentation for the system and, and I want to be able to, to migrate that and run it uh, in Azure. So uh, wouldn't it be great if somebody's working on that problem? So my turn to stand up now and say that we're super excited today to announce uh, the launch of a new company called the Migration Factory. So we're working in close partnership and collaboration with Microsoft on this. And the idea is that we're going to provide a service that will fully automate conversion of your on-prem BizTalk solutions to the cloud. Now, that's a very tricky thing to say. It's, it's, it's quite a, I guess you could say, controversial thing to say, because what do we mean by fully automate? It's a hard problem to solve, and we're not going to get all the way there. So what that means is we will provide help for you on the way as we do it. And initially, our offering is going to be BizTalk on-prem to Logic Apps, and that's Logic Apps and API Apps, whether or not they're running in the cloud, or whether or not they're running through, say, the Azure Pack or something on-prem, will support both. And the other thing, too, is we're architecting things in such a way that uh, it doesn't really matter what the source is. So at the moment, we support BizTalk, but let's say, for example, you're using a BizTalk you know, uh, competitor, such as, uh, I don't know, <coughs> MuleSoft something like that, you know, we could handle conversion of that as well, up to Logic Apps as well. And we could also handle conversion of BizTalk artifacts to, say, Workflow as well. That's the plan. How is this going to work? It's not a simple problem to solve. So the idea that we're working with at the moment, and we're still in fairly early stages, uh, is that you, as the customer, will export your existing uh, BizTalk assets as an MSI. Because who knows, you, look, you might not have the source code for them or anything like that in the moment, so you might not be able to do it from inside Visual Studio. But export it as an MSI from one of your environments. You'll upload that to our website. We will parse those assets. We'll go through the MSI file, look at the bindings, look at all the assemblies that are in there, pull out all the BizTalk assets that are in there, uh, and we'll analyze them. And we'll work out what we can and what we can't convert. And then we'll show you a report. And the report will outline what we can and can't convert and give you sort of a, a weighting and an idea of what we can and can't do, and also a list of steps for what you will need to do to bring yourself all the way up to 100%. So simple scenarios or standard scenarios, you know, you might have a, a receive port, receive pipeline, that sort of thing we're likely to do 100%. Orchestrations, it will depend, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So we, we bring that back to you, we show you the report, you'll accept it, You'll choose what you want to migrate, uh, and then we'll have to take payment. This is not a free service. However, having said that, what we're aiming for is this to be a low-cost service. Um, we're still working this all out, but what we're aiming for is that it should be no more than 25% of the cost of doing it yourself. So if something was going to cost you 100 US dollars to convert, we would charge you no more than 25 US dollars to do it. You accept that. We do the conversion and we upload it to your subscription. So that means that we need to provision all the API apps, we need to upload all the schemas, we upload any third party assemblies you might use, and we create all the logic apps that you use. Just to illustrate that we're not just making this stuff up and achieving the impossible, um, what Dan's going to start to, uh, to show you is, is kind of walking you through that, that sequence of steps, you know, the process that you go through to take an existing BizTalk solution, and this, in this case, taking existing pipelines and, uh, and convert them. Right. So first of all, who here in the room is a BizTalk developer? Nobody. <laughs> Fantastic. Cool. Excellent. <laughs> That's a good place to start. So the scenario I'm going to give you here is a fairly standard scenario. So we've got a received a file from a customer, it's a CSV file, so a flat file. Uh, we want to parse that, we want to decode that into, using the flat file decoder, uh, we want to decode that into an XML file, we want to validate it, we want to transform it, and we want to publish it to the message box. So, I don't know, how many people here have had that scenario and developed something for that? Okay, there's a fair few hands there, it's a fairly standard scenario. 
So what we're seeing here, I'm just showing the solution I created for doing this. Very simple. We've got an order that we receive in flat file. We've got a custom pipeline that has two standard BizTalk components in it, the flat file encoder and an XML validator. Uh, we have the flat file definition here for an order. We've got a map that literally converts the flat file version of the order to um, another version of the order. And then we've got a number of schemas here. Now, I have deployed this locally to uh, my BizTalk server. I'm running BizTalk server 2013 here. Uh, if I can find where my mouse is on here. Um, right, there we are. Cool. So if we look in here, we've got one receive port. We've got one receive port here. Now, we actually have two receive locations here. So I've got a flat file one, which is enabled, and I've also got an MQ one as well. Uh, at this moment, we can't use the MQ API app uh, in a logic app in the same way that we can use, say, the file connector or the FPT con FTP connector. So I'm not going to show that at the moment, but I can show you the flat file one here. So pretty standard stuff going on here. Receive location using the, um, the file adapter and running our custom pipeline here as well. Uh, if I go back to the uh, receive port over here, you'll see that I'm also running uh, an inbound map here. So this is where I'm converting that uh, flat file version of the, uh, the order that I've received into the non-flat file version. So what we would do from here is we would right click and we would export that as an MSI file. Next, 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 next. Excellent, yes, exists, I want to export it. Excellent, all done. Now, traditionally, what would happen at this point on the website is you would upload that MSI file. But for the purposes of the demo today, I'm going to show you that uh, in a console window. Now, I'm not expecting you all to be able to read that at all. But what you're seeing there is uh, a logic app definition. So that's JSON. What I've done is we have gone through the MSI file. We have pulled out all the various bits. We've pulled out the receive ports, receive locations. We've worked out the adapters, the adapter properties, the transforms. And what we generate is a package. And in that package is a collection of API apps that we need to provision. It's a collection of resources that we need to upload. And it's a collection of flow definitions. And what I'm going to show you now, and this is the bit I'm hoping works, um, it, comes, it, it tends to work sometimes and not. Uh, if I bring up the portal, and I think it's been easier. I've got an a, um, API app here, sorry, a logic app I created that's currently empty. Right, so here we have an empty logic app. Now, if I go, I don't know if you guys know about this, but you can click on code view here, and this shows you the JSON that sits behind a logic app, because that's all it is. It's a JSON definition. So the language here describes what our logic app is going to do. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste in the um, I'm going to paste in the <coughs> JSON code that we just generated. We forgot to sacrifice the chickens first. Yeah, I know. So this worked yesterday, then it stopped working last night, and it was working at 2 a.m. this morning. So one of the things you find when you paste in is it will sit there and it will think about things for a little bit. And I've got to wait until I can go back to code view. Come on. There we go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Portal's not all that quick at the moment. If this doesn't work in the next minute, I'm going to go to one I created earlier. No, OK. I'm hoping that will come back in a second. Second? Open it. <laughs> I had it open in Chrome, and Chrome crashed, so I don't know. OK. Let's close that down because I don't think that's going to come back to us uh, just yet. <laughs> so
So if we go back um, home again. Oh, it's completely locked up Internet Explorer at the moment, isn't it? Oh, there we go. Okay, it's coming back. Could hear a pin drop. You could, couldn't you? Yes. <laughs> hoping this works. I'm also opening it from the Chrome in the background as well, hoping that will come up quicker. What you do see when this works is a um, is this. Luckily, I took a screenshot earlier when it did work. That's what you see. <laughs> right. So, what are we looking at here? If you think about when we do our conversion, if you've got a, a situation where you've got a receive port picking up from a um, receive location picking up from a file and publishing to a send port, only some of those things exist inside Logic Apps at the moment. So what we can see up here is at the very left-hand side, we're using the file connector. So that present, represents the file adapter we'd be using on-prem. So we've basically mapped the file adapter to the file connector. If you use the MQ series or MQSC adapter, we'll map that to the MQ connector. If you use the FTP adapter, we map that to the FPT, FTP connector. And we also populate all the, uh, all the properties of the connector as well for you. Then we move on to the actual parts of the pipeline. So what we've got next here is we've got the flat file encoder. Uh, that's converting your CSV format into the uh, XML format using the flat file map that you've created. Oh, sorry, flat file schema you've created. Uh, then we have the XML validator. So all this has been passed from the pipeline, and we've recreated it as um, API apps in a logic app. Then because we had a transform, we've also created a transform up here as well. These are all chained together. And then if you look on the very right, What's just going off the side of the screen here is service bus. This might seem like an interesting one to you, but if you think about it, we have no equivalent of the message box in Logic Apps or in Azure at all. What we do have, though, is something that is equivalent, and that is service bus. We can publish messages to service bus, and we can create topics, which are like subscriptions. So we can subscribe to messages from service bus as well. So the idea we've got is that we publish to Service Bus. If you're in a receive, you know, if you're receiving a message, we publish it to Service Bus. But if we're converting a send port or an orchestration, then what we're doing is we're subscribing. We will create on your behalf a subscription. So we'll create the topics in Service Bus that will subscribe to those messages um, and then start off either the flow or the, you know, the equivalent of the send port to get your messages out and off to somewhere else. I'll have one more look and see whether or not this has come back to work again. Uh, I doubt it. Oh, no, there it is. That's it. That's the real thing. That's not actually... Um, eh, they look the same because I took a <laughs> screenshot earlier. So <laughs> it worked. <laughs> it just took 10 minutes. So what you're seeing here is... <laughs> thank you. What you're seeing here is exactly what I just described in my, um, my, my screenshot, but we've actually pasted this. So this is generated code that we have generated from an MSI. That's not fake, what you just saw. We actually went through the MSI and generated this from that uh, BizTalk solution that you saw earlier. So we can do that right now. Uh, what I want to talk about a little bit is what comes next after that. So let's go back to the presentation here. So, what's our scope? What are we aiming for? Well, everything. That's what we'd like to be able to do. We'd like to do anything you do, we'd like to be able to convert. That's not really possible, though, because some things are harder than others. There's a lot of gaps and differences between, you know, what we do in BizTalk and what we do in competitive products and what we can do in Logic Apps and API Apps. Um, semantically, they're different. There's no one-to-one -one mapping between, say, the expressions you might have in an orchestration or the shapes in an orchestration and API apps. There are some matches. So it won't be everything, but it's going to be as close as we can get. The other thing, too, is that we want to weight it in such a way that this talk features that more people use, we want to focus on converting those first so that we can hit a higher percentage of um, conversion as well. So the other thing, too, is we want to stress the importance of this parse stage at the beginning. 
So we will parse it through and we'll work out what we can and can't convert. And we'll give you a report. And so you can have a look at that and see what we are going to be able to do and what we can't do. And what's more, we'll give you a, a, a to-do list. So what more do you need to do after you convert to get it working end to end? Um, so we know the, the syntax and some of the semantics for what we need to convert. Uh, and we will do structural conversion of, say, maps. So maps are relatively trivial. We bring along the schemas for that. Um, rules as well. Pipelines, we show you pipeli showed you pipelines as well, here as well. Pipeline components is an interesting one. Um, we've got some, some good ideas on that and some, some working prototypes. One of the ideas is that we, if you write a custom pipeline component, we will go through, we will pull out the code you've written, and we will host that in an API app for you, in a custom API app. That's one of the ideas that we've got at the moment. Uh, orchestrations. So we're going to talk about that on the next slide, but what we'd like to be able to do is take an orchestration and migrate that to a particular target. So orchestrations. Orchestrations is a difficult problem to solve, either way we look at it. Uh, people often use orchestrations, but not always necessarily. There are a lot of cases where people have used orchestrations, but they could have just done a, a simple messaging scenario. And logic apps, the architecture for logic apps is fundamentally different than abyssal orchestration. That's what makes this problem um, tricky. So one of the things, for example, execution of a logic app is partly explicit and partly inferred. So as an example, if I have a trigger in a logic app, um, which then goes to, and then I have two actions after that and I don't put conditions on, those actions will run in parallel. I think Stephen covered this the other day, that by default things will run in parallel unless you put a condition, you chain them together. That's different than a business orchestration where things run in serial unless you tell it to run in parallel. Uh, there's a lot of orchestration features that you'll find today in logic apps, but they're done in different ways. So the classic is if then else. It's very visible when you look in an orchestration with a decision shape and things like that. You look into a logic app, it's not quite so easily visible the, the if-then-else syntax. You can do it, but it's just done in a different way. So what are our plans around this? We can already parse out ODX files. Um, those of you that were at the summit, uh, I think it was at last year you did your presentation? Yeah. Um, sure, so saw John parsing out an ODX file and doing a conversion of that. We can also target multiple formats depending on the complexity of the orchestration. So a simple orchestration might go directly to a logic app um, with some standard and some custom uh, API apps in it. Uh, an expression, so say you had an expression in an orchestration that held, had a whole lot of C-sharp code in it. Uh, one of the things we can do today is we can take that expression uh, and we can pull out that C-sharp code, we can compile it up and we can put it into a custom logic app. Sorry, a custom API app. So we can call that API app from inside a logic app as well. So that's one of the things we can do right now. Uh, the other idea we've got is as a service. So this is uh, quite an interesting idea and that is to take a complex orchestration and actually convert it to a workflow. So some people might hear that you know, Windows workflow is, is dead, but one of the things that we could do is convert it to a workflow, host that up in Azure as a service, and then call that from a logic app as a service. So for complex orchestrations, that might be the way to do it. But BizTalk is more than this, and uh, I'm going to let John continue on from here. Yep, OK, so that list uh, that we've been working down that I showed at the beginning, the classic BizTalk architecture with a message box in the middle and everything off to the left and right. So we've walked through quite a few things already, you know, orchestration, um, uh, at least in terms of the structural kind of flowchart metaphor to logic apps, we've looked at pipelines, we've looked at pipeline components, we've looked at uh, maps and therefore, you know, schemas as well, you know, the underlying message types. Um, but I guess the, the thing uh, a lot of people are most interested in is, is orchestration. So um, Dan's already shared some ideas on this and how far we've got. You know, today we can, we can parse these things out. Um, but we know that, you know, logic apps, the way it works today, is just a, it's just a different paradigm. Um, and one of the things that makes it very explicit to us is, is the different messaging patterns that BizTalk kind of supports out of the box. And, uh, you know, it has a lot, of, uh, a lot of smarts and a lot of features that enable you to implement a variety of different standard messaging patterns that, uh, that lots of people use. You know, you've got the canonical request, reply, and solicit response. Obviously, that's there in Logic Apps. It may, uh, 
it may not be immediately apparent, I guess, when you use the designer and you kind of start off with a trigger, for example, but uh, as uh, Stephen pointed out yesterday, all of these things have an endpoint as well. You, know, you can call a logic app um, and that'll uh, basically invoke uh, an instance of that will start running and uh, you can specify what you want as an output. You know, the, uh, the, the flow language actually allows you to specify the outputs, which you could be an aggregate of all the various steps that it went through to return a response back to you. So those kind of things are catered for. Um, but some things aren't today, you know, things like correlation, um, the, the ability to have essentially a multi-entrant um, uh, flow or, or, or process where I can, uh, I can kick it off and then provide additional messages while it's running. You know, you can imagine, though, if when you look at these in a different way, that maybe I can split that up. You know, taking um, a, a convoy pattern, for example, uh, which relies on that, where if I have a, um, a sequential convoy and I have, you know, that initial receive shape and then another one in the loop, it kind of creates that pattern. But I could actually split that out and, and uh, have an initial uh, initiating uh, receive uh, as one logic app and then have another one chained off of it that uh, will then eat through any additional messages that are delivered. So as I said at the beginning, you know, some of these problems will be a different way of looking at it. And that's really what we're, uh, or, you know, uh, Dan talked about, you know, focusing on, on what uh, the realization of these things look like. Because you kind of got, when you look at migration or conversion, you kind of got these three sort of fundamental buckets that it's going to fall into. You either have, um, uh, the first one is you, either, you have, an, have uh, an exact kind of feature comparison between the two, where you can, uh, you, uh, maybe uh, the, the uh, logic apps or API apps have a superset of what you can do with or server, so you know, the conversion is, is apparent, it, it's straightforward. Uh, then you may have a functional difference or a semantic difference, and that's, that's where the tricky stuff comes in, in terms of how these engines work and what they do and how they do what they do. You know, talked about transactions, talked about the uh, guarantee, uh, delivery guarantees, those types of things. And then you can just have gaps, right? And, uh, and that comes down to you know, the, uh, uh, the relationship with the product group to, to kind of work out uh, what the best way to solve those gaps are. You know, is this something that we, can be done in tooling um, as, as part of this effort, or is this something that will come in the product anyway, in which case it falls into the first bucket? Um, so you know, what we're showing you today is obviously some, some concrete examples of what, uh, uh, what we've been able to achieve and get working, and obviously some, some forward thoughts you know, on, uh, on the work that we've done. Um, because of, because of these different characteristics, there's still you know more work to do. And the final thing you know that was on that list, I'm just going to cover quickly, just in the interest of time, is BAM and, and tracking. So, you know, uh, okay, there's no BAM um, in the in the current service, but there is tracking. And um, you know, one of the things that's uh, uh, one of the ways of looking at this is that uh, BAM is an API. So. Um, because it, uh, the way it's kind of integrated into a BizLock solution, it doesn't necessarily break anything if it's not there. So again, it doesn't necessarily stop conversion um, of orchestrations and other artifacts that use the BAM API to uh, logic apps. Um, so it's something that could be added later, basically, is the point there. Um, you could take a dependency on it, of course. You could be waiting for data to be written to, um, uh, to the BAM database, but, but that's unusual. Um, but and Logic Apps provides this tracking infrastructure. So there's an API, a REST API, to be able to get at all that tracking data. There's archival capabilities as well. So it's not like you, you don't have anything, um, and you can track through the state. But uh, one of the things that, um, again, we're investigating is, is being able to track you know, custom items and those types of things, typically things you'd use BAM for, and we, how we could light that up. Um, so I just mentioned that just to kind of complete out that original, original list. So let's just recap. So where, where are we? So you know, here's, here's the list I started with, at least in terms of that BizTalk uh, server architecture. And most of these things look good. I, I was actually going to, um, I thought about showing an initial column of how it looked last year, because it actually looks better now than it did last year in terms of the mapping when I talked about you know, how you would think about moving BizTalk server solutions to BizTalk services v1. Um, a lot of these things are, are more smiley faces, or at least you know, OK faces, than they were last year, because there was no rules engine in, in Business Services v1. There's some other pieces missing. You know, there is more capability here now. Yeah, this is really a superset of what you've been able to do in Business Services. So uh, from a migration perspective, it, uh, things become more possible than, than they were a year ago, which is great. Um, as I said, you know, the, the orchestration one is the ch still the challenging one that, uh, that's being worked on in terms of how, you know, what makes sense. And I think what, what probably makes sense there is to try to identify the different workflow, or workflow orchestration shapes and provide different targets for those, as Dan described. Uh, again, we, you know, we love your feedback on that. And that takes us to, you know, the final slide where, um, you know, register your interest. You know, um, throwing up a registration page. If, you, if this sounds like something that's useful to you, something you'd like to be involved in and give feedback, and, you know, uh, thinking of providing early bits later this year so, so you can try it for yourselves. 
Um, also interested in the kind of pricing models. Dan talked to a little bit about this in terms of um, you know sort of t-shirt size model where you parse out the uh, solution. You know you've seen how that works. Take the original MSI, pull all the pieces out, and then then do some statistical analysis over that and work out whether it's kind of small, medium, large, i.e. easy, medium, or complex, and and uh, provide a sort of uh, a pricing model that's, uh, in accordance with that to achieve the uh, the goal of just making this significantly cheaper. You know a no-brainer in terms of how you. Uh, you know, you reach for this tool or this, this, this service to do the conversion for you, right? That it's just simply much quicker, easier, cheaper, more reliable than, than just doing this stuff by hand, especially, you know, with, with large solutions. Um, but of course, there's always going to be that, that, that gap, right? You know, and uh, you can imagine the kind of, uh, you, there's some assistance required. There's those manual steps, you know, on that to-do list in the report that you might want to do it for me, do it with me kind of model where um, yeah, you just need to take it to that, that last mile, because that last mile is, is uh, potentially you know, going to be the tricky bit. Um, but you know, just to be clear, this is, uh, the intention is an automated self-service um, um, offering. So you, you, you go to the portal, you can upload your MSIs, you get the report, you decide whether you're going to accept that base, it'll give you the pricing in advance so you know where you're getting into, what it can do, what it can't do, and then you accept that, you get the solution back, it hosts it, you get the source code, all the rest of it, right? So you own it. Um, but again, as I said, uh, please you know, uh, register your interest um, if you're interested and, uh, and let us know what you think, uh, both what you heard today and, and uh, uh, we'll be kind of providing frequent updates to this as, as we make more progress and see what you guys, uh, see what you guys think, and especially in terms of priorities, you know, what type of solutions do you have today? It's probably just worth mentioning that we're, we're hoping, we're planning basically to release a sort of beta version of the tool later this year. Um, it all depends on how we get on with the preview portal and also the feedback we get from people in terms of what people would like to see and what features they'd like to see as well. So please, we, we really do want your feedback on whether this is something that you would use and if you would, how you would use it. So that's it. So thank you. <laughs>